Good morning, all. Uh, keep the applause till the end. Uh, and I heard when I was uh, I was listening to some of you guys, and some of you have already been to Candlewood, and are so. Let me see a raise of hands of uh, who's already been there. Who knows where Candlewood is? Okay, good, good, good. How many of you have heard of the Candlewood Lake Authority? Okay, a few. That's not bad. The, this is the agency I work for. It's a uh, 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 an agency, a local agency that serves the five towns, and we'll talk about you know Candlewood and those five towns around Candlewood. And so instead of each town having their own agency to kind of deal with lake-related issues, they create one, and, and that's us. And before that, uh, it was mentioned that I ran a research lab at Connecticut College, and uh, we did some very interesting kinds of research there. The paleoimmunology being the thing we primarily, uh, primary thing we did, and that is a, a kind of science that we use to kind of understand the history of the water quality of lakes going back in time, let's say before people were out there with their pH meters and their different equipment. So we have a way of using fossils to understand the water quality of the lake, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So what we'll do is uh, talk a little bit about the cultural history. Uh, so maybe about a quarter of you guys are from or have been to Canada might know a little bit about it. Very fascinating cultural history. We'll talk about the water quality history using some of that paleolimnology we talked about. And, uh, and then we'll talk on some of the, uh, discuss some of the current issues. And there's a lot of current issues uh, as it pertains to, to Candlewood Lake. I need you guys to help me keep. I have, I have orders to stay between that picture and that picture. So if I wander too far, give me back in the middle. I always like to give a little bearing as to where we actually are. This is, uh, this is, um, Actually, I'm actually about 4,000 feet above Candlewood Lake here in my, uh, my cousin's little Cessna. And I'm hanging out in the window he's driving. Uh, so we're kind of looking in this direction here. There is a, this is Candlewood, Candlewood Isle in New Fairfield. So that's a view of the lake from about 4,000 feet. It's quite, quite, uh, quite an interesting view from up there. Quiz. Anyone who knows where the word, the name Candlewood came from? This is probably for the guys that are, for folks that are local. What's that? No idea? Turns out, turns out that, uh, that early uh, inhabitants would actually use the bark of uh, one of the trees, probably white pine. You break, you break a, a, a branch off and the resin, the sap would actually light. And so, ergo candlewood. How big is the lake in acres? We'll throw out a number, any number. Ten million. <laughs> a little, a little, a little, a little inflated. About fifty, about fifty-four hundred acres of surface water. Not a huge lake relative to some of the lakes in, in throughout the country. Uh, it is the largest in Connecticut. It is the largest in Connecticut and man-made. How many gallons of water are there in Candlewood? Fifty-four billion gallons. Now, what does that mean? What does fifty-four billion gallons of water mean? I always, you know how there's always different equivalents. You can measure in English, measure things in metric. Well, there's there's an equivalent to the fifty-four billion gallons, and you can uh, look at it in terms of cubic feet. And so, if you the the equivalent of fifty-four billion gallons is seven billion cubic feet, and it turns out that a basketball, any players, any any hoop players in here? Uh, and it turns out that a basketball is about a cubic foot. Okay, so it takes about it would take about seven billion basketballs to fill up Candlewood Lake. That's a lot of basketballs. Here's a, a map of Connecticut, and there's this river that runs up from uh, up in Massachusetts down this way, cuts through. Uh, if you guys do any geology, you'll learn this is some. There's marble valleys in here, and it, there's a marble valley where this river cuts through. Houstonic River and cuts out this way here, and there's Candlewood Lake. Um, 148 miles long. You can't talk about Candlewood without talking about the Houstonic River because that's where the water came from, as you'll you'll see in a bit. 148 miles long, flashy, meaning that it's not a consistently flowing river. Sometimes it's running fast, sometimes it's not so fast, trickling along, very flashy. But 
cultural history going way back, native populations using the rivers, and then even uh, as settlers came in, damming it up and using different parts of the river for, for, for different kinds of things. So it became uh, kind of a, um, uh, a, a natural process to use the river going forward, and they used the river for hydroelectric. So starting, here's uh, again the Houstonic River coming down this way, all right? And back in uh, 1870, they, they put the first dam on the Houstonic River. Later, Bulls Bridge. I'm sure you know, we're not too far from Bulls Bridge here. There's another uh, hydro facility up there. Falls Village, back in 8, 1914. Stevenson's Dam, that backs up Lake Zor on the river. Then they created the Rocky River Pump Station, and that's what created Candlewood Lake. And we'll talk about how that occurred in a few seconds. But last but not least, the Chapaw Dam uh, Station, that dam created Lake Luanona. So Candlewood is really part of a larger hydroelectric facility that's used to create uh, hydroelectric power. The difference here is, is that Lake Luanona, Lake Zor, uh, they are traditional run-of-the-river reservoirs, or Candlewood is not. Candlewood is considered, referred to a, as a pump storage reservoir, meaning that they essentially dammed up a adjacent river valley, in this case the Rocky River Valley, and then pumped the water up from, in this case, the Houstonic River to, to, to create, the, create the lake. Uh, the reason is that uh, the river had limited ability to produce power, so they were trying to maximize those waters to create as much power as they could. Uh, they were able to utilize a supply and demand uh, marketing process to use the lake to generate power. You know, if you're pumping water up to the lake, that requires electricity, and then if you let the water out, that's creating electricity. So. The way they make money off of Rocky River and, and Candlewood is they, they let the, the water out to generate power when prices are up, and these prices can fluctuate in the course of a day, uh, and then they pump the water back up to the lake when the prices are down later at night. So that's uh, how they use this peak demand. Um, you know, back in the, in the 1920s, before that, you know, the area was growing quickly, they needed power, and then also, the Rocky River pump storage concept, the water in Candlewood that was let out of Candlewood would also turn turbines, go through the dams below it at, at, at Stevenson and Chapag. So that was a lot of the concepts behind this, this pump storage reservoir. Um, some of the, 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 the urban legend about Candlewood, yes, there was a town underneath the lake. Uh, actually, it wasn't a town. It's kind of a small little village called uh, Jerusalem. Those of you, anyone here who live in the town of New Milford? A couple of you. Um, if you're on Lake Road North, you would pass the, the road, Jerusalem Hill Road, I believe it is. And uh, if you were to t go out from there into the lake, that's where the, the little, little town of Jerusalem would have been, which was most of it was relocated. Uh, I mentioned there's five towns. It created. Um, uh, enough power to, to, to power 31,000 homes. Going back to our basketball scenario, uh, it creates this power by moving 2,100 cubic feet per second. Think about that, 2,100 basketballs moving at one second. That's a lot of energy. So under that lake, there were homes, farms, schools, churches, and cemeteries. If you ever take a trip up to uh, Sherman, uh, right behind the Sherman School, there is a, there, there's, there's a, uh, headstones in a little cemetery back there that were relocated along with the, along with the, the inhabitants of those graves to, the, uh, to this, this new, uh, uh, new, new cemetery. Lots of, lots of wood was cleared, actually stacked down there. A lot of it was burned, but a, a vast majority of it is still down there. And what they did is they kind of stacked it in these rows and chained it down to the bottom. And when, there's, a, there's a process that's used in other parts of the world where they actually do that to, to wood to create kind of a patina on the wood, which is then used to make different kinds of, 
uh, wood products, furniture and things of that nature. So there has been interest in that wood in Canada wood for many years. The problem is now is you know 70 something years later that wood is covered by about uh, you know 30 to 40 centimeters of sediment which accumulates over time in lakes and so they're, they're, they haven't been really allowed to go in there and, uh, and uh, uh, harvest that. Created by a company, United Gas Improvement Company. There was five camps throughout the lake. Uh, the biggest one was UGIville in New Milford, and we'll show you a picture of that. And uh, about 1,000 1, men worked on the project from 1926 to 1928. This is, this is when they were building Canada with Lake. There's UGIville um, right there. It's, it's up, in the, up in the New Milford arm of Candlewood. Um, if anyone's familiar with the lake, this is what actually represents the main dam on the lake. Uh, I'll show you another picture of this. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with uh, the cartoon, The Flintstones. I'm kind of dating myself, but uh, uh, Fred Flintstone uh, worked on a, you know, he worked in construction and his, I remember his, uh, the thing he used to sit in and drive the brontosaurus. We're, we're not too far, uh, we're not too far, far removed from from that that technology there. That's actually uh, UGIville after a, a small flood. You can see the the tops of these homes. Again, this is the main dam, and we're looking in a in a southerly direction, down uh, down the lake, like that. There's, uh, there's Fred Flintstone again, making, creating the, the main dam. This main dam up in New Milford is about 100 feet tall. It's earth and wooden dam. Uh, so that was the technology there then, and that's what they, they made it out of. Same, same, uh, same general area. On the flip side, and I don't know how many of you have seen this pipe. If you don't go down Route 7, uh, Route 7 North, you'll see that pipe going up the hill. That's actually the pipe where they pump the water up from the river to the lake. So the river would be somewhere down here. This is the, the facility there, and there's up and over the ridge to the, to the uh, Drowned River Valley, the Houstonic River Valley. And that's what it kind of looks like today. It looks, um, if you were to drive past it, that's what you see today. There's the, uh, the and I'm sure all of you have, have driven up that way, have seen this facility. That's the Rocky River Power Plant. Um, just a little, a little uh, info on the kinds of energy that's required and the pumping. And uh, very, it, it, was, it, was, it was the first of its kind in the country, the, the Rocky River Power Plant. So it's got very, some, some sig uh, historical significance. <coughs> Uh, here we go, and they use it for a variety of things. You know, they use uh, they use it to, uh, for for flood safety. They can pump water into Candlewood if if uh, the rivers are backing up, so they can main you know for, uh, safety that way. They uh, um, they manage the other facilities down downstream from Rocky River. So the Rocky River power station is probably the kind of the heart of the whole hydro facility. So the main dam, as I mentioned, is up there. There's actually several other dams, including one way down here in, um, in, uh, uh, in Danbury. Rocky River, by the way, kind of flows this way. Before it was flooded, it came down this way and flowed up this way and out before it got dammed up here. <clears throat> There's a, uh, if you guys are here in the summertime, uh, the town of Sherman, the Historical Society in Sherman, puts on a really cool exhibit, uh, kind of like the, the past, present, and future of Candlewood Lake, and they, they provi provide a lot of the uh, historical newspaper clippings. And this one is from 1927 while they're working on the lake, and it's a huge spectacle. I mean, people are coming from all over to see Candlewood Lake being created. Again, it was, it was one of the first of its kind. But <clears throat> my favorite part, oop, of the article is at the, at the last part where it says, someday there will be uh, a pretty lake bordered perhaps, that's my favorite word, perhaps by numerous dwellings. And if you know anything about Candoa Lake, there's uh, <laughs> numerous is, is, is kind of an understatement. There's probably 1,500, 1,600 lakeside homes 
there are about 60 lake communities, private little uh, you know, tax districts, lake associations, collectively about 3,700 homes in those. So yes, we did get perhaps numerous dwellings. And those numerous dwellings, as well as the, the development are in the five towns surrounding the lake, will have an impact on the, on the history of the water quality of the lake. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second or two. Another article I like to share uh, when, I, when I speak to groups is you know, the first time lake is almost navigated. And, and uh, uh, those of you who do any boating, especially with little outboards, can always can kind of cause a few problems. They, they, they get in this little outboard. The boat owner and the newspaper reporter, and you know, as things often happen, the boat engine cuts out. They're drifting around. It becomes this this huge event. They write the story about it. But again, it's the last part of the um, last part of the article that I find most uh, interesting and, and amusing. Canada Lake will become all that is promised, and all kinds of boating will be enjoyed there in the future. Uh, I wonder if they knew exactly how much boating they thought was going to occur there. We have boating pot, we have boating, recreational boating on that lake to a level where sometimes it becomes problematic. Sometimes it becomes a safety issue. We've done studies looking at the number of operating boats on the lake at a given time, and there are areas of the lake that actually get a little, a little, little, uh, little dangerous. So yes, we have many, many dwellings, and yes, we have much boating. You guys all have uh, discussed or heard the concept of watersheds. Everyone know what a watershed? No, no watershed. One. So a watershed is a, is a very important uh, concept in any kind of water-related uh, science, whether it's you know management or, or or study. The watershed is essentially the area that drains towards the lake. If I were to find all the high points around Candlewood and connect them all together. You would create this area in which if a, dro a drop of wa rainwater falls inside, it travels towards the lake. If it falls outside, you know, if it falls out here, it might run to the Still River, might run to the Hoostonic River, might run somewhere else. But everything that falls inside of here drains towards the lake. Does that mean that every drop of water that falls in there gets to the lake? No. But that's the direction it flows to, and a lot of it will get there. Uh, I mentioned the five towns, Brookfield, Danbury, New Fairfield, New Milford, and Sherman. By and large, the, the greatest area uh, of Canada lies in the town of, of New Fairfield, followed by, uh, followed by Sherman. Uh, I just put that in, and uh, I don't know if you guys have talked about climate change at all. <laughs> this was taken. Uh, I'll tell you when it wasn't taken. It wasn't taken last winter because we didn't have any ice on the vast majority of the lake at all last year. And this is becoming a more frequent and frequent occurrence. We still get ice cover on particular years. But last year, and this is the middle of the lake, and there's a, if you're familiar with it, there's a little uh, house on an island out there. And, uh, and we did not see that last year. That's kind of what we're looking at here. So we're like kind of looking in this middle area here. What is that doing up there? Uh, I use this slide to kind of re remind me where I'm going next here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a little paleo limnology. What's the old saying? Dead men tell. No tales. Dead men tell no tales. Exactly. So I, a little play on words. Dead algae tell no tales, or do they? Uh, and that's kind of what we use. We use the uh, fossils from the algae to kind of understand historical water quality in a lot of lakes, uh, not only Candlewood, but, but probably 60, 70 lakes in, in, in uh, Connecticut, uh, an equal number in, in, uh, in Cape, the Cape Cod, and elsewhere. And these are just uh, images of uh, some of the algae that we might use to understand uh, historical water quality in, in a particular lake. You can use organisms like algae because if you look at them along an environmental gradient, meaning that you have all kinds of lakes. There are lakes, for instance, that have low pH, and there are lakes that have high pH, and you have lakes that kind of fit throughout the entire environmental gradient. So if you start studying these groups of organisms, 
you'll find that using an example, this particular uh, organism you might find in this range, most of the time you'll find in this range of pH, but you might find a little bit out here. And you keep looking at the different groups. So, and these are from different, these are all different lakes, right? And these are the organisms you're finding. And so if you look and you find a group of organisms from the lake that are comprised of this here, then you can kind of say, well, the pH probably falls somewhere in this part of the, of the environmental gradient. So the organisms will, the different species of a, diff of a, of a taxonomic group will occupy different areas within an environmental range. And you can use that information to kind of understand historical uh, changes in historical water quality. Same kind of thing, this kind of slide shows the same kind of thing where you might have a, a pH gradient, okay, and for one particular organism you find at the low end, and this is its optima here, so at a pH of 5, lakes that have a pH of 5 you'd find lots of this stuff, but you also find it in, uh, in lakes within this range, and you have different organisms occupying different ranges along this environmental gradient. So now you understand what the, the different floors are in the different lakes. How do you use that to, to understand historical water quality? Well, what you do is you go out and you, and you core the lake. And this is a, a sediment core. And I'll show you how that works in a second. So pretend this is the, the bottom of the lake, the deepest spot of the lake. And that's the surface of the mud. And that's, you know, that's the mud underneath. So obviously, there goes my piston core. We let that off the boat nice and gradually. It goes into the sediments. We can retrieve that core. And then the bottom of the mud represents the oldest mud. And then the top of the core, the most recent sediments. You can cut that thing up. There's different kinds of equipment you would use to cut it into slices. You would analyze the organisms from each slice. And you can also date the sediments. I'm sure you guys have all heard about carbon-14 and other kinds of radioactive isotope dating methods. There are dating methods uh, that they use for analyzing you know, things within the last 100 years or so. Uh, and that's what we use uh, for, for this, the sediments. And these are some of the organisms we might encounter. Uh, the group that we use are called scaled chrysophytes. Uh, what makes them interesting and useful is that their cell wall, these individuals, the, the, the cell walls of the individual cells, are actually composed of uh, siliceous pieces, scales, so to speak. Here's one cell, and you can kind of see the covering with all these, these different uh, scales. And because it's siliceous, like glass, they preserve in the sediments. They don't decompose. I'm just going to flip through a couple of... Um, a couple of uh, uh, slides of these things. This is an interesting critter here that we found. Uh, when you get into grad school, and if you're doing science, one of the things you always want to do is get your, get, you want to be like part of a paper. You want to be published. You want to be part of a, a, an author or a co-author on a paper. So my advisor, he had found this particular organism only one spot in all the research he ever did throughout the Northeast. He only found it in one spot. It was in Lake Kenosha in Danbury. If you know anything about Lake Kenosha, it's it's a lot of runoff from, from, uh, from I-84. It's got very high salt levels in it. Uh, so he says to me, he says, listen, if you, got, if you can get a good sample of this, it's good meaning you're able to kind of mount it, and I can get good photographs of it, I'll make you co-author of the paper. We'll write the paper up. What he didn't tell me was is that the only time you'll find this thing is under about 12 inches of ice in the middle of the winter. So for an entire winter, I was going out there with a a nice a hand auger, no less. And then you're, you're cutting a hole that big, and you're trying to get a, a net with a diameter about that big in there, and you're collecting the sample, and you go back to the lab, and up, oh, didn't get that one, and you know, a week later, back out there. So finally, we got it, and, uh, and that was, uh, he named it after the state of Connecticut, Malamonas Canensis. But the thing you're to look at here, and this is a different species, just kind of look at the, the pattern on, on the, these scales, and you'll note there's a very different. This is, you can see there's a, a distinct pattern for this critter here 
This is very distinct there. So they're fairly easy to tell apart, even at the microscopic level. I mean, we're looking at things here that are, you know, smaller. These scales are in the, in the magnitude of, you know, 10 to 20 microns big. So that's pretty small stuff. What you then can do is after you looked at all those layers is you can kind of figure out for any particular species what its relative abundance was throughout time. So depth in the core equals time in the core because we were able to date it. This is obviously not Candlewood because Candlewood does not go back to 1893, uh, but it's another lake, but it, it provides an example. So for instance, this particular critter here, very abundant. At the lower, at the bottom of the core, and then you know somewhere around um, you know, 1970, the thing becomes less and less abundant. You've got other organisms that are becoming more abundant as you move up the core. The composition of, of the floor is changing quite dramatically, and those changes, if you know where each of these individual organisms, the range they like, the environmental conditions they like, you can then use that to go back and understand particular. Uh, environmental condition at any given date. So, what about Candlewood? We did all this for Candlewood and what we find, well, let me kind of give you some bearings here. Here's our, our timeline is going to run this way. So Candlewood was, the, the, date, the lake was completed in 1929 and we're moving you know, forward in time this way and think of these two axes here you know, from low levels of pollutant to high level, low level to high level of pollutant. So we looked at the, the, the changes and what happens in the first 20 years? Are the pollutant levels getting lower or higher? Lower, which surprised me. They actually went down. Okay, they went down this way. This is low, this is high. They went down. And it turns out, and it turned out once I saw this, I went scrambling into the scientific literature Reservoirs do that. Reservoirs go through this phase where they, they a, lot of the, a lot of the materials that have been suspended kind of settle out and things get clearer, things get cleaner. And that's what happened for Candlewood. They reach an equilibrium with the surrounding watershed, you know, different pollutants that might be running into the lake. So they reach an equilibrium with the surrounding watershed. In 1950, the research that we did uh, indicated that's when Candlewood was probably at its cleanest. And what's interesting, and I always enjoy speaking to senior citizen groups and, uh, because they always tell me, you know, geez, it was 1950, I go out in the Candlewood Lake and I stand in the water up to my chin and I can look down and see my feet and I can't do that anymore. And of course, their anecdotal data uh, correspond, corresponds quite nicely with the, the empirical data from the paleo-limnological research. They were absolutely right on. It was about 1950 when, when the lake was at its cleanest. Following that, what happens? Things start changing and, and, not, and not for the better. Um, nutrient levels start increasing. Uh, nutrients like uh, phos uh, phosphorus is one of the, the uh, um, key nutrients for algal growth, algae growth in the lake. They start to increase as does a whole variety of, uh, of dissolved salts. Conductivity is kind of a measurement of uh, dissolved salts in water. So things are being added into the lake. Now I mentioned that watershed thing and how that can kind of change with, with the water quality of the lake. I looked at that compared to the combined population of the five towns since uh, 1930. And you'll see that during this period here where things are getting cleaner, there's not a lot of change in the population of the five towns, meaning that there wasn't a lot of land use change. And then things start to change post-World War II growth, things of that nature, and you can kind of see a, you know, a very distinct parallel between what's happening in here and what's happening with the, in, within the five towns. Suggesting that what we were doing in the watershed of the lake was having an impact on, on the water quality. Why? What happens to lakes where the land use is being changed? A lot of it's related to stormwater. Stormwater comes down, hits the ground. In a natural setting, a natural landscape, much of the stormwater infiltrates it, soaks into the ground. 
fill, recharges uh, groundwater, those sorts of things. A small percentage of it runs on the ground laterally. Some of it goes back up in evaporation. When you change the landscape, create more surfaces that don't allow for water to infiltrate, roofs, roads, those sorts of things, you change these dynamics. So instead of having the vast majority of the water infiltrating into the ground, it's now running this way. Um, and when it's doing that, it's picking up all those things. Remember I said before, the watershed drains towards the lake. So all that rainwater is picking up these things and they end up in the lake and changing the water quality, water quality of the lake. This is not unique to Candlewood. This is pretty common across the state, across the, uh, the country, uh, across the, the planet. You know, we, we've, we've, we understand that we've had that impact on, on our water resources because of uh, how we've done things in the past. Things are getting much better now in terms of how we develop and how we uh, prevent that kind of thing from happening. But uh, still the number one water quality issue uh, in the U.S., polluted uh, runoff. It's interesting too, you know, people don't, even in the neighborhoods around Candlewood, in the, in the, in the little, little um, um, communities, they have storm drains there. Those storm drains invariably drain into the lake. And, and I, I, I'm just always, you know, you, at one point you gotta, you gotta kinda hold your, bite your tongue, but I watch people use the storm drain for all of their, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning the leaves off my lawn. Well, let's just stick them in the storm drain. Um, I'm, I'm washing all this in my wash. Well, let's just get the storm drain. But they, what they don't understand is that stuff goes towards the lake. You guys talk about invasive species yet? Not yet, but you will? Okay, you will talk about invasive species. Uh, species oftentimes that are not native to an area uh, will get established in areas where they aren't supposed to be and cause all kinds of environmental and recreational problems. At Candlewood, we have uh, several of those, and the no most notorious of them is this plant called Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, it was something that actually has its origins in the, the Eurasian uh, continent, probably came across in the, um, in the aquaria trade. You know, someone might have bought some for their aquarium and got tired of their aquarium and threw it out into a pond where it got established, you know, a big enough pond where boats can come in, and then it gets kind of transported from lake to lake to lake on the trailers that go in to take the boats out. The stuff can, can kind of survive a period of time out of the water. So it kind of get, moves around. Uh, I forget when this thing got established in the United States, but uh, I think it was probably in the late, the mid the late 70s when it got into Candlewood. And now we have a, a very serious problem with the Eurasian water milfoil. Invasive species, from an ecological perspective, will oftentimes outcompete the native things, reducing biodiversity. And when you reduce biodiversity in any kind of ecosystem, uh, that, that system is now set up to crash. Because things often will, you know, you might have some kind of uh, disease or a parasite that might specifically hit one kind of plant. But if you have others there, if the diversity is good, then you lose that one plant, you got others to back it up. Now let's say your Asian water milfoil outcompetes everything in Candlewood Lake and 95% of the, of the flora of the plant life in the lake is this, and then something comes in and kills that, then the system has, is a, has an opportunity to crash, which is not a good thing. Um, there's a lake again in the five towns, and these are sites that uh, uh, we actually do water quality monitoring at on a regular basis. But I wanted to show this map because I'm going to show you uh, some close-ups of this area here and this area down here. And it's going to be kind of a time series from, I think it's starting in 2000, but well, we'll see. But we'll see um, uh, close-ups of these two images over a course of several years. So this is that top area, Allen's Cove up in Sherman, 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, and the red areas are, are the, the milfoil. And you can kind of see there's a, a huge difference in how much coverage that milfoil uh, 
the coverage of that milfoil in this area here and down in uh, the Allen's Co the Echo Bay Cove from year to year to year. And the reason it's kind of different is because they what they do on Candua to manage the weeds is uh, they lower the, the lake by about 10 feet in the winter time. And by doing that, it exposes those sediments to the winter elements and kills the roots of these plants. So obviously, in the winter prior to the 2007 summer season, they had a deep drawdown, which killed the weeds. This year here, they didn't, and they all came back. So that's how they manage it. Now, there's a lot of interest in doing this deep drawdown every year. But the flip side of the deep drawdown is it's not very species specific. Meaning that if, let's say you are a native plant, or let's say you're an animal <laughs> that needs to be in that lake as well, and you're exposed for the winter, uh, we are going to impact your survivability as well. So what they try to do is provide some balance by doing it every other year to allow some of the good things to kind of come back. So uh, I mentioned the deep drawdown, and I'll let me see what that. This is kind of like uh, between November and, and the end of December. This is the level of the lake that goes down and it comes back up. Uh, we've been looking closely at this and how they actually do, do the deep drawdown from year to year to year. And we think that they standardize how they do it. We can get a better, a better uh, result from, from the process. We're experimenting with some organisms, some native things, the, the native milfoil weevil, which um, we had in Candlewood. Doesn't seem to have any. Doesn't seem to have any effect in controlling the uh, the milfoil. But there's a company we've been working with that uh, actually cultures these things or breeds these things. And they say if you jumpstart the population, they'll help you keep the milfoil down. So we have some sites where we're actually stocking these things to see if they can get established at levels where they can then control the milfoil. These little guys actually they lay their eggs on the stems. The larvae will actually bore in and then and then and then kind of migrate down reducing the buoyancy of this plant, and the plant sinks to the bottom and dies. And when it does that, it allows more sunlight in, and uh, supposedly will allow the native plants to start growing back. You know, milfoil, if you ever see it when it's doing really, really doing well, it, it forms these really thick canopies on the surface of the water, essentially blocking out sunlight underneath. So we're experimenting with, with uh, milfoil weevils. Zebra mussels, another invasive species, but instead of a plant, we're talking about an invasive aquatic animal. These things probably got into the, into the country, I think it was the late 80s. By late 90s, I think it was 98, they actually found them in two lakes in Connecticut, uh, up, in, up in the Salisbury region, uh, East Twin and West Twin Lake. But that was the last we heard of them for quite a long period of time until very recently when they were reported in a lake up in Western Mass called Laurel Lake. Yeah. Where this Same place, Eurasian, the Eurasian continent. Yeah, Asia. yeah, yeah, good question. Um, Laurel Lake, so there was a, an identified population in this lake, and this lake uh, there's a stream that runs from the lake to the Houstonic River. And so they found them in the lake, they found them in this little brook that runs from the lake to, to the river, and they found them below the confluence of the, of the, uh, of the, the brook and, and, the, and, the, and the river. A year later, they showed up in those reservoirs I mentioned before, Lil and Zor, in 2010. So although it hasn't been proven yet, there's a good probability that, that they probably kind of drifted down their planktonic stage of their life, uh, their early life stages are planktonic, they probably got they left the lake in the brook, in the river, floated down, and by the time they were ready to kind of uh, uh, fall out of the water column and attach themselves to something, they were in Lake Luna and Zor. And of course, that water travels right past the pump up to Candlewood. Now, we don't have them in Candlewood yet, but we're, we're closely monitoring, uh, monitoring that. Uh, I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned in Connecticut, there's these two lakes up here, that was the first place they, they appeared back in the late 90s, and then and then nothing for, for, for many, many years. And Laurel Lake is, if I were to extend up, is probably up in this area here, and the Houstonic River comes down like that. Yeah, and then I mentioned, uh, you know, this is Lake Little Known here where they're found. This is Lake Zor, and this is where the water gets pumped up to Canada, right here. So they're coming, if, if they came from Laurel Lake, then they're 
they're floating by the uptake to Canada, uptake to Canada with Lake. I'm going to shift gear, gears here uh, and talk about some other things that we're involved in and concerned about. Yeah. Uh, why is your muscles so bad? Uh, the, for a variety of reasons, they they can actually crash the ecosystem. They they can strip out all the nutrients, so they kind of they they shift the, the trophic dynamics, you know where where food might not be available for other organisms. They filter filter a lot of the water, and there's so many of them. Uh, what invasive species do is tend to, you know, multiply lots and lots of them to the point where they're just out of balance with the rest of the ecology, so they can strip out all the nutrients. They will again, they will outcompete native things, displace native organisms, reduce biodiversity. I mean, a lot, invasive species often do the same kinds of things. So that's from the ecological perspective. From the recreational perspective, you know, the, you, in lakes where these things get established, you can't really walk on the beach without something on your feet now. Um, they can clog, they'll get attached to your boats, to other kinds of hard surfaces. If they get in your uptake for, for cool and cooling your boat, <laughs> you'll be needing uh, some engine work rather, rather, rather uh, soon too. So they have both uh, recreational, cultural, and ecological Yeah, and think about it, um, you know, the, just go back to the plants for a second. The invasive plant, Eurasian water milfoil, that's limited in terms of where it's going to grow by light. So in deep water, you don't get light. You don't get plants, right? Because there's not enough light for, for the plant to survive. So now you add, you add zebra mussels to the mix, and they filter out all the water and make the water actually clearer. And that's what he was referencing, and the water gets clearer. Well, guess what? Now you're going to get the invasive plant growing in deeper water because you're getting more light down at, at, at deeper depths. So, five minutes? So, so I don't know if you yeah, I'll flip through with you. I, I want to talk about a little, uh, uh, you guys are going to talk about um, uh, endangered species. And the state maintains a list of, uh, of all the sightings of di different endangered species in the state. And, and so this is the map from that, their, their database. And each one of these points represents Something that's either endangered or, or threatened or a species of special concern. And that was in 2001. Several years later, guess what? The entire, the entire uh, area of Candlewood was included in the map. And if you are out there long enough, you will, you will run across these organisms fairly, uh, fairly, fairly frequently. So we, Candlewood not only provides for a wonderful recreational and, and community resource, but it's a, it's a huge environmental resource to this, this area. So I think that's it for, for the presentation and then uh, we'll try to answer some questions. I know you guys are supposed to uh, check, check the website and, uh, and come up with some questions. So let's see what you came up with. Yes. Yep. Sure. Um, so you got the people who might live right on the edge of the lake, and obviously they can have an impact on the water quality. Then you got the maybe the people who live in the communities whose storm drains are going that way. But, but again, if you live within that that watershed area, then even if you're at the far reaches, that water is is trying to travel. You know, gravity brings it down. So, you're what you're. What you're doing, maybe miles away, can have an impact on a um, on a, on the water quality of the lake. There's a great there's a great video if you're ever interested in about watersheds, and I, I can get it to you. But it kind of really helps understand that watershed impact, and it kind of uses the beaches of California, which is actually where I grew up, and how you know from miles and miles and miles away, the they get they get uh, sewer treatment plant affluent into the beaches. So you don't have to be right on the water to, to have an impact on the lake. And the other thing is, is that even if you're not in the watershed of Candlewood Lake, you're in somebody else's watershed. So, uh, uh, and in Connecticut, we're not as nearly as tough as they are in New York. In New York State, think about it, water resources there, 
you're trying to you're trying to keep alive you know population centers like New York City their water is their gold to them I mean that's that's doesn't get any more important in, in, than trying to protect those water resources when you got that many people in a, in a one center of uh, of of the state all right thanks guys